Father, we thank thee once more that we are together to study. We pray for your spirit. We pray that you will speak to us. May we learn the things we need to learn and hold on to them. May they truly be incorporated in our life. Amen. Okay, we'll read verses 8 and 9. Upon the Son and power was given unto him to scorch men. Great Controversy 628. The prophets thus describe the condition of the earth at this fearful time. The land mourneth because the harvest of the field is perished. All the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. The seed is rotten under their clods. The garners are laid desolate. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. The rivers of water are dried up, and the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Songs of the temple shall be howling on the day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth for silence. Well, it doesn't sound like a very good time. Early writings, page 289. The wrath of God in the seven last plagues has been visited upon the inhabitants of the earth, causing them to gnaw their tongues for pain and to curse God. The false shepherds had been the, been the signal objects of Jehovah's wrath. Their eyes had consumed away in their sockets and their holes, and their tongues in their mouths while they stood upon their feet. After the saints had been delivered by the voice of God, the wicked multitude turned their rage upon one another. The earth seemed to be deluged with blood, and dead bodies were from one end of it to the other. Well, that's the whole world. The whole world has gone crazy. Testimonies, volume 7, page 182. The world is filled with storm and war and variance, yet under one head, the papal power, the people will unite to oppose God in the person of his witnesses. This union is cemented by the great apostate. So, when the world is in this condition, people are just killing each other. They're doing it under one head. The Protestant churches are not a factor anymore. The Protestants are Catholics. I wanted you to see that. One head for the whole world. So the Catholic Church really is going to take over. And the Protestant churches will have nothing to do with it. They will have one head, the papacy. Verses 13 and 14, I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So now we're up to the three frogs. Let's see who they are. The early writings, 262. I saw that the saints must have a thorough understanding of present truth. So, do I have a thorough understanding of the present truth? It says the saints will have it, which they will be obliged to maintain from the scriptures. They must understand the state of the dead, for the spirits of devils will yet appear to them professing to be beloved relatives or friends. So we had this to look forward to. The devils are going to show themselves like their friends, dead friends to us. What are we going to do about it? Who will declare to them unscriptural doctrines? They will do all in their power 
to excite sympathy and will work miracles before them to confirm what they declare. So the devil will be working miracles and they will look and talk just like our relatives did. And we're going to say, wait a minute. <laughs> and we better know the scriptures. The Great Controversy, page 561. He, Satan, has not yet reached the full accomplishment of his designs, but it will be reached in the last remnant of time. Except those who are kept by the power of God through faith in his word, the whole world will be swept into the ranks of this delusion. The people are fast being lulled to a false security to be awakened only by the outpouring of the wrath of God. Testimonies, Volume 5, 451. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. Righteousness will be gone from this nation. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power. Now, we just read the papacy is going to be the head of the world, one power. So that means the Protestants will give whatever power they have to the papacy. When she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, so they do it two ways, to the papacy and spiritualism. When under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican nation. There will be no more Protestants. They will all be Catholics, and there will be no more government such as we have, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions. Then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan, and the end is near. As the approach of the Roman armies was assigned to the disciples of the impending destruction of Jerusalem, so may this apostasy be assigned to us that the limit of God's forbearance is reached, that the measure of our nation's iniquity is full, and that the angel of mercy is about to take her flight, never to return. So we know what to look for. At least we should. It's all written down for us. Great Controversy 624. Fearful sights of a supernatural character will soon be revealed in the heavens in token of the power of miracle-working demons. The spirits of devils will go forth to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to fasten them in deception and to urge them on to unite with Satan in his last struggle against the government of heaven. By these agencies, rulers and subjects will alike be deceived. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. So the whole world has been led by this deception into a massive delusion. They will think that dead people have come back to tell us what the truth is. They'll believe it. And they'll believe that the people that don't believe what these demons and these false dead people are saying, they're going to say, these are the deceived ones. They're ruining the world. When all that happens, the whole world will be under the Pope, and he, they will all do what he says. He will say, Sunday is the day of God, and they will all believe it. And when he tells them, we have to get rid of these people who are not keeping Sunday and don't have the Trinity, 
And don't have the idea that the Son of God is a metaphor. And they don't, and he'll go right down the list. They don't speak in unknown tongues. They don't. You see, the Catholic Church went into all of these things since the 1900s. They don't do the celebration. We have forgotten about that, but it's still going on. They don't. And all right, there's a long list of things they do. And of course, the Protestants are doing them too. Verse 16, into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Testimonies, Volume 6, 406. The battle of Armageddon is soon to be fought. He on whose vesture is written the name, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, is soon to lead forth the armies of heaven. Evil angels unite their powers with the evil men. So at this point in history, evil angels and evil men join. And as they have been in constant conflict and attained an experience in the best modes of deception in battle, see, they know how to fight. They know how to do torture. They know how to do it. And attained an experience in the best modes of deception in battle and have been strengthening for centuries. They've been building their tools. They will not yield the last great final contest without a desperate struggle. All the world will be on one side or the other side of the question. The Battle of Armageddon will be fought, and that day must find none of us sleeping. Trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded. What does that mean, trumpet after trumpet? Well, it's not trumpets. Angels, when they sing, sound like a trumpet. The angels will be making their sounds. <laughs> see, see, we must not think it's just trumpets, somebody. It's not brass trumpets, it's angels. Vile after vile poured out one after another upon the inhabitants of the earth. Scenes of stupendous interest are right upon us. Review and Herald, May 7th, 1901. Two great opposing powers are revealed in the last great battle. Now, we've read that several times. But we need to get that. There's only two sides to this. The side of Jesus and the other side of Satan. That's all there is. On one side stands the creator of heaven and earth. All on his side bear his signet. So they will all have his sign. Now, we mustn't assume that everybody goes to church is a Christian. They're just going to church. If they have his sign, then they will be on his side. They are obedient to his command. Now, that is a whole different thing. They go into church. They are obedient to his commands. On the other side stands the Prince of Darkness, with those who have chosen apostasy and rebellion. So what's the key word here? Those who are obedient to Christ are on his side. Those who are rebels are on Satan's side. Now that's something to get a hold of. Manuscript 1A, 1890. Satan is also mustering his forces of evil, going forth into the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them under his banner, to be trained for the battle, for the mastery in the last great conflict. Fundamental principles will be brought out and decisions made in regard to them. Now, did you catch that? Fundamental principles. Who has fundamental principles? 
There's nobody on the planet who has them today except a few isolated people. They believe in the fundamental principles that two people wrote down. And those principles were in 1872, and those are the fundamental principles of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's what the old pioneers believe. James White put it down. He said, we don't write these to see who can stay in the church and who can't. So we didn't do that. We just write them because at the present time, we are in unity. The people who believe these things are one group. Well, that doesn't exist anymore. We have at least four different groups in the church. We've gone a long ways away from them. But it says here at this time, Fundamental principles will be brought out. So the fundamental principles are still here, and they're going to be brought back. We're starting to see part of that right now. But that must happen. People aren't going to think they invented something. The fundamental principles of the pioneer church will be brought back. And there will be a group of people who are unity in those principles. Skepticism is prevailing everywhere. Now she tells the other side, skepticism is prevailing everywhere. Well, that's not unity. That skepticism has many forms. Ungodliness abounds. The faith of the individual. That's one at a time. The individual members of the church would be tested as though there were not another person in the world. So a whole church is not going to be tested. That's not going to happen. An individual will be tested as though he's the only person in the world. And if he stays faithful, he will become one of the 144,000. Manuscript 175, 1899. We need to study the outpouring out of the seventh law. The powers of evil will not yield up the conflict without a struggle, but providence has a part to act in the battle of Armageddon. When the earth is lighted with the glory, of the angel of Revelation 18. The religious elements, good and evil, will awake from slumber and the armies of the living God will take the field. Now, she makes it sound like God's army is the same size as Satan's army, but that's not true. God's army is a small army. Satan's army is this, covers the whole world, and they think, well, we've got the numbers, we'll get them. So these statements shouldn't fool us. It's not an equal battle at all, except that Jesus and his small army is going to win. <laughs> Letter 79, 1900, which go forth to gather them. All who have not the spirit of truth will unite under the leadership of satanic agencies. In other words, they will believe the Catholic Church. They are to be kept under control till the time shall come for the great battle of Armageddon. Review and Herald, December 24th, 1889. Satan is a powerful general, has taken the field, and in this last remnant of time, he is working through all conceivable methods to close the door against light that God would come to his people. He is sweeping the whole world into his ranks. Now, what is the sign of that light. The sign, it's not here in this 
It just says the light of God. What is the sign of that light? Well, the sign is the sun. The sun is the light. Jesus came to bring the light of God. And when a person becomes a Christian, they become the light of God, the sun. Now, it's interesting that Satan knew all of that, and he used the sun as his symbol. <laughs> we won't get into that, but there's a lot in that word light. And because the light is so important in the health message, that's one of the doctors. Son, we'll get into that. 14 and 16, the battle of the great day. Manuscript 172, 1899. There are only two parties in our world, those who are loyal to God, and those who stand under the banner of the Prince of Darkness. Satan and his angels will come down with power and signs and lion wonders to deceive those who dwell on the earth and, if possible, the very elect. The crisis is right upon us. Is this to paralyze the energy of those who have a knowledge of the truth? That's John 17, 3. The knowledge of the true God. Do the people today know the true God? They say it's God the Father. That's not the true God. The true God is Jesus. Now, we get the Father when we have Jesus. They are one in purpose. But on the earth, the only true God is Jesus. And even the people who believe John 73, they've put the wrong God in the place. You see how, how Satan gets people? The Bible is very clear. Who is the creator? Well, the Father is the creator. He created Jesus. You see, we don't want to say that. But he did. He made Jesus. He did not make him by creation. There was no other creation around. He made him by taking him out of himself. And when he made him, it says he, made, he was made. It says that. And it says that in the Bible. When he made Jesus, then he said, Now you have the power as God to create you create everything else. And that's what the Bible says he did. The Father wrought all creation in Christ. But we don't teach these things anymore. We teach it took three gods to create. Well, we're not any better if we get confused and put the Father there instead of Christ. You see, there are all, there are all kinds of confusing things that, that Satan has done. We need to get out of those things and believe the truth. Satan and his angels will come down with power. It says he, they come down. Why did they come down? Where are they coming down from? Shouldn't they come up from there? <laughs> you see, he's going to do that. He's going to come down. We need to read these senses and believe them. Is this the influence of the powers of deception so far reaching that the influence of truth will be overpowered? Well, that's a good question. Will the people who believe in the Son of God finally realize that He is our God? That's what the Bible calls Him. Our God, our Lord. The battle of Armageddon is soon to be fought. We're not ready for it. <laughs> All right, Review and Herald, May 13, 1899. The earth is to be the battlefield, the scene of the final contest and the final victory. Now, that means for the whole universe, not just earth. That's the final victory. Here, where for so long Satan has led men against God, rebellion is to be forever suppressed. 
so there will no longer be any rebellion after the Battle of Armageddon. That's the last battle. Now, there's something wrong with that because that's at the beginning of the thousand years. Do you see that? At the end of the thousand years, God is going to come again with fire. And when all the people are died, they will never have another resurrection. They'll be dead forever. Testimonies, Volume 7, page 141, The Great Conflict that Satan created in the heavenly courts is soon, very soon, to be forever decided. Soon all the inhabitants of the earth will have taken sides, either for or against the government of heaven. Verse 17, A great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. Great Controversy, page 615. When the irrevocable decision of the sanctuary has been pronounced and the destiny of the world has been forever fixed, the inhabitants of the earth will know it not. So I want to ask you a question. If the world doesn't know the investigative judgment has, has ended, in the sanctuary. How does Satan know that it's done? How would he know? He's not in heaven. He can't get in there. He doesn't know. He doesn't know when probation is ended. So how can it be said there are two clauses of probation? That doesn't work. Satan would have to know there's two clauses. It just doesn't work. It is at midnight, in the middle of the, the night, that God manifests his power for the deliverance of his people. The sun appears, shining in his strength. The sun shows at midnight. <laughs> in the midst of the angry heavens is one clear space of indescribable glory, whence comes the voice of God like the sound of many waters, saying, it is done. Now, when Jesus died, that statement was made, it is done. Well, here it said again, it is done. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 509. At his own will, God summons the forces of nature to overthrow the might of his enemies. Now, God here means Christ, okay? Fire and hell, snow, and a vaporous stormy wind fulfilling his word. His word is the scriptures. That's his word. That's Jesus. We are told of a great battle to take place in the closing scenes of Earth's history when Jehovah hath opened his army. Jehovah here is Jesus, and hath brought forth the weapons of his indignation. Hast thou, he inquires, entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? The revelator describes the destruction that is to take place when the great voice of the temple of heaven announces, It is done, he says. There fell upon men a great hail of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. So hail, which weighs a talent. How much does a talent weigh? Well, that's anywhere between 75 and 85 pounds. One piece of hail. Now, that's going to cause a mighty destruction. <laughs> okay. Thunders and lightnings, verse 18. And that was a great earthquake. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 110. 
I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. As lightnings from the heavens unite with fire in the earth, mountains will burn like a furnace and will pour forth terrific streams of lava, overwhelming gardens and fields, villages and cities. Seeding molten masses thrown into the rivers will cause the waters to boil, sending forth massive rocks with indescribable violence and scattering their broken fragments upon the land. Rivers will be dried up. The earth will be convulsed. Everywhere there will be dreadful earthquakes and eruptions. Thus God will destroy the wicked from off the earth. Now you put that together and what we have is a picture of volcanoes on the earth. Lava overcoming the cities. That's just not a few drops of lava. That's a bunch of lava covering the cities. Great Controversy 637. The whole earth heaves and swells like the waves of the sea. Its surface is breaking up. Its very foundation seems to be giving way. Mountain chains are sinking. Inhabited islands disappear. Great hailstones, everyone about the weight of a talent, are doing their work of destruction. Now, I read about the islands disappearing. When I was in Hawaii, I read it to the people. They didn't know that, that islands would disappear. <laughs> well, they better get out of there before then. <laughs> Chapter 17, verse 2. The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. You see, that's something we, I don't believe we have talked about very much because the people in the church don't seem to know that. Why? Would the people of the earth be drunk with the wine of Babylon? Because it's the leader now. So they are drunk with it. Great Controversy 536. The theory of eternal torment is one of the false doctrines that constitute the wine of the abominations of Babylon, of which she makes all nations drink. Everybody believes in an everlasting burning hell. That ministers of Christ should have accepted this heresy and proclaimed it from the sacred desk is indeed a mystery. But they all teach it. They all teach an everlasting burning hell. They received it from Rome. Well, this is how they become papists. They're teaching a papal error, but that's not the only one, as they received the false Sabbath. True, it has been taught by great and good men. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Great, good men taught it. But the light on this subject has not come to them as it has come to us. So here's a little group of people, 50 Adventists, who wouldn't believe that lie. But it came to great and good men who died that way. So what is that? <laughs> they all believe it. Great Controversy 382. Babylon is said to be the mother of the harlots. Well, it's true. There it is. By her daughters must be symbolized churches that cling to her doctrines. You mean you're a daughter of Babylon if you believe her doctrines? What is the Trinity that's a doctrine of Babylon? And traditions and follow her example of sacrificing the truth and the approval of God in order to form an awful alliance with the world. 
Well, I don't call the church Babylon, but maybe I could call it a daughter of Babylon and read it. <laughs> because I can't escape that. Ellen White asks the question, are we part of the family of Babylon now? When she was alive, she saw it. So I have to hold that in abeyance. Letter 232, 1899. In the 17th of Revelation is foretold the destruction of all the churches who corrupt themselves by idolatrous devotion to the service of the papacy. You see, they're Catholics and they don't know it. They give devotion. And she said, all the churches that do that. Well, if all really means all, that also means the Seventh Edwin Church. We are devoted to their trinity. We are devoted to their lots of things. Those who have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Thus is represented the papal power in which with all the deceivableness of unrighteousness by outside attraction and gorgeous display deceives all nations, promising them as did Satan, our first parents, all good to those who receive its mark and all harm to those who oppose its fallacies. What is it that gives its kingdom this power? Protestantism, a power while professing to have the temper and spirit of a lamb and to be allied to heaven, speaks with the voice of a dragon. Does the Seventh Adventist Church speak? with the voice of a dragon? I'm afraid it does. They call it disfellowshipping, and you have nothing to say about it. You disfellowship when they speak. It is moved by a power from beneath. Now, these words are written down for us. We should pay attention to them, and I'm talking to people who believe these words. We should pay attention to them. Verse 4, Testimonies, Volume 1, page 136. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Yet the very ones that profess to be washed by the blood of Jesus Build for them, can dress up and decorate their poor mortal bodies and dare profess to be followers of the holy self-denying humble pattern. Well, when I get into the dress reform, maybe we'll read this one again. Oh, that all could see this as God sees it and showed it to me. It seemed too much for me to bear to hear the anguish of soul that I felt as I beheld it. Said the angel, God's people are peculiar. That's what God says. God's people are peculiar. Such he is purifying unto himself. That's Jesus. Jesus is purifying himself a people to himself. Now we're going to read these things when we get over into the reforms. The reforms all come from Jesus. They're his message to his people. We can't afford to ignore them. When the exterior is hung with ribbons, collars, and needless things, it is plainly shows that the love for all this is in the heart unless such persons are cleansed from their corruption. They can never see God, for only the pure in heart will see him. 
Now that word never is a terrible word. They will never see him. Education, page 248. A person's character is judged by his style of dress. A refined taste. A cultivated mind will be revealed in the choice of simple and appropriate attire. Chaste simplicity in dress when united with a modesty of demeanor, will go far towards surrounding a young woman with the atmosphere of sacred reserve, which will be to her a shield from a thousand perils. So she's talking in particular to women here, but it includes men. When women put on dainty little ribbons and things like that, and wear short dresses instead of dresses that cover her legs, and doesn't wear anything on her sleeves at all. These things all mount up. That makes you a worldling. But today the church doesn't even talk about it. Verse 5. Mystery. Babylon the Great. Evangelism 365. We are not to think but the chosen ones of God who are trying to walk in the light. Compose Babylon. Now, I want you to know that I don't believe we can call the church Babylon today as a, it's just a thing to say. It doesn't mean it isn't. We just can't say it. But there comes a time in history when it becomes Babylon, and we don't know when that is. But somebody will know it's happened. Babylon has been fostering poisonous doctrines, the wine of error. That's one of the signs of Babylon. And we can't be playing a game forever. It's got to happen. We must eventually get there and say, well, they're teaching these various errors that's in Babylon. What else can we call it? Verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. Acts of the Apostles 371. The heart of the true minister is filled with an intense longing to save souls. That should be the only thing that a minister has in him with intense longing. Time and strength are spent. Toilsome effort is not shunned, for others must hear the truths that wrought in his own soul such gladness and peace and joy. Well, I want to tell you, a minister that's looking forward to the day when he no longer has to work, and he's a retired minister, paid minister, paid to live, and he's looking forward to it. I'm sorry. There's something wrong with that. No minister should feel that. With invitations and pleadings mingled with the assurance of God's love, he seeks to win souls to Jesus, and in heaven he's numbered among those who are called and chosen and faithful. That's another word for obedient. Manuscript 24, 1891. There will be a universal bond of union. Did you hear the word universal? A universal bond of union, one great harmony. A confederacy of Satan's forces. So, this universal bond of unity, this great harmony, is for Satan, with Satan. Thus is manifested the same arbitrary, oppressive power against religious liberty, freedom to worship God, according to the dictates of conscience as we manifested by the papacy, a church that says you can't worship God the way you decide is under the papacy. 
when in the past it persecuted those who dared to refuse to conform with the religious rites and ceremonies of Romanism. And that's why we're doing it. The reason we tell people today they are persecuted and we can get away with it is because we will not follow papal persecution. What is the Trinity? That's papal. What is the metaphor of Son of God? That's papal. What is? Go down the long list. And all of it is papal. And we follow a great deal of it. We, it, it seems like, oh no, we keep the Sabbath. The rest of it doesn't matter. Oh, wait a minute, are we keeping the Sabbath? I think we should look at that. In the warfare to be waged in the last days, they will be united in opposition to God's people. All the corrupt powers that have apostatized from the allegiance to the law of God. Now, we claim to keep the law of God, but I think it's just a claim. In this warfare, the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment will be the great point at issue, for in the Sabbath commandment, the great lawgiver identifies himself, not themselves, himself as their creator of the heavens and the earth. Jesus is the creator. We don't teach that. If we believe Jesus is the creator, you can be disfellowshipped. I wonder what's left of the Adventist church. What do we really teach that God teaches? We're playing some sort of a horrible game and it's going to catch us. Review and Herald, November 29th, 1892. As Christ was glorified on the day of Pentecost. There's two things. Pentecost, the power of Pentecost is going to come again. What was the power of Pentecost? Have we studied Pentecost to see what it was? It was angels. Angels brought the fire from heaven and put it on 3,000 individuals. That's the power of Pentecost, and that power comes from Christ. So will he again. You see, Pentecost and the angels are coming again. The angels are the third power. Be glorified in the closing work of the gospel when he shall prepare a people to stand at the final test. The angels will bring the power of Pentecost, the power of Jesus, so they stand the final test in the closing conflict of the great controversy. So it's the power of Pentecost. It's not the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the power of Jesus and the angels. Verse 15, the waters which thou sawest where the horse sits are peoples, multitudes, and nations and tongues. Winds are a symbol of strife. The four winds of heaven striving upon the great sea represent the terrible scenes of conquest and revolution by which kingdoms have attained to power. Great Controversy 440. 18. The woman which thou sawest is the great city which reigneth over kings of the earth. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 167. The state of corruption and apostasy that in the last days would exist in the religious world was represented to the prophet John in the vision of Babylon. Now, I'm going to stop reading. At the beginning of today's meeting, we read that there's only one head fighting God. It's the head called the papacy. And everybody in the world 
will follow the papacy. There can be no compromise between God and the world, no turning back to secure earthly treasures. The great mass of the world will reject God's mercy and will be overwhelmed in swift and irretrievable ruin. Now that's the first time we have read something where she says it that way. The great mass of the world will reject Christ. The great mass. What does she call the people of God? She said, very few. So it's a great mass against the few at Armageddon. But those who heed the warning shall dwell in the secret place of the Most High and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And here the Almighty is Jesus, the secret place of the Most High. I hear is Jesus, but Jesus says, I, I offered you a place to hide, like a hen. So it's his, his wings are the secret place where we hide. And that's where we go during the Battle of Armageddon. There are many more things we could have read, but we want to continue. We want to finish this series. I think we'll end with that for today. We'll go to chapter 18. I don't think chapter 18 has been understood either. We'll get into that with some good statements. Okay. Father, thank you. You are our Father. We thank you that you're revealing all these things to us. There are things we read, but somebody read them to us and told us wrong things about them, and we have learned many wrong things. Let us hear them from you, and let us hear them correctly, and see we've been deceived. Then let us understand how to live the truth, how to give up things we thought we needed, and live only for you. We thank you for guiding us.